Hi, Deborah. Hi, Molly. Hi, Frank and Tracy. Hi, William. Your does. Oh, so nice to see everyone. Welcome to our Meet the Graduate webinar. We're going to get started in just a few minutes while we allow attendees to join us. Hi, Josh and Liz and Bianca, Adolfo. Hi, Allison. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Primrose and Phil. Hi, Elias. Oh, so nice to see everyone. I'm Associate Professor Nicolette McGuire. I'm Director of Student Affairs at OUM. And I just want to welcome you all here to our Meet the Graduate webinar with Dr. Wendy Chen. Before we begin, I just want to acknowledge that I'm joining you from the lands of the Anishinaabe peoples in tiny Ontario, Canada. It really is called tiny, and it really is tiny. And I just want to acknowledge also that in Canada today, it's the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation. So I just want to invite you all to think about the lands that you um, sit on and the peoples who came before you and to honour um, them in that space. Um, and, you know, as you um, join the OUM community, you'll know that we are uh, very much value the diversity that we have and the ability of our students to be able to serve underserved communities in Oceania and beyond with their studies. So thanks very much for to all of you for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Wendy Chen, for agreeing to come by and share some of your um, learning, some of your experience with our prospective and new students. So I'm going to um, let all students know that I'll be asking Dr. Chen um, a number of questions so that we can get to know her better. If you'd like to ask Dr. Chen a question, you can go ahead and type your question at any time point into the Q&A window, and I'll read some of those out um, as time allows for us to do that. So Dr. Chen, can we begin? Would you introduce yourself to our participants today? Hi, thank you for inviting me here. Um... As stated, my name is Wendy Chen. Um, I am a OUM graduate of 2017. Um, I have uh, since um, did a residency in internal medicine um, in Chicago. That's the that Chicago behind me there. Um, I uh, did a chief year um, at. Oak Park, which is a suburb of Chicago. Um, and then I have just finished my geriatric fellowship at University of Chicago. Um, and I'm currently applying for my first attending job. So you've been really busy since your graduation five years ago. So maybe we'll start where you're at now because we have um, prospective students that are from the United States, from Australia, Canada, New Zealand, Samoa. Could you tell us a little bit about what attendings do and what type of position that you're hoping to get? Sure. Um, actually, interestingly enough, um, the uh, title attending is does come with a little bit of controversy. Um, <laughs> <you're>, <laughs> yeah, um, for some people, attending means that you've completed your residency um, and no longer in any training. Um, but for other people, it means that you are um, actively teaching um, and are affiliated with a residency or medical school. Um, so there's a little bit of um, <laughs> of controversy there. Um, so I currently am applying to become a hospitalist, meaning I work inside the hospital, um, as well as get a um, academic appointment, meaning that I am um, working with learners. Um, so that could be on any level, <laughs> medical school, um, resident, a currently working physician, um, as well as nurse practitioners. Wonderful. And are you hoping to stay in Chicago? I am. Yeah, we have um, Chicago has been good, good to myself <laughs> and my spouse um, and career wise. Um, I really enjoy Chicago. I uh, love the public transportation. Um, it's still too cold for me, even though I've been here for a few <laughs> years. I was told I would, I would get used to it. Yeah, I haven't gotten used to it. But 
Um, other than the cold, I, um, it's just, it's pretty great. Um, I'm really enjoying it. So, yeah. So you also did a fellowship with University of Chicago um, in geriatric medicine. So tell us a little bit about that. How were you able to secure that fellowship and what was that like? Yeah, so um, applying for fellowship is similar to applying for residency. Um, in fact, it gave me a little bit of PTSD to sign on to the website. Um, uh, but um, it's very similar. You sign on the website, you do your application, you have your letters of recommendation, um, you find out uh, what programs are participating in the match, they call it the match as well. Um, and um, you put in your applications to those places, they offer you interviews, you interview with them, both sides make a list um, and that gets put into a computer, a computer splits it out and poof, you're matched. So very similar in uh, residency to residency in that, in that part. Um, different in that, um, there's a lot less people. <laughs> um, you really do need someone um, from your residency or somebody that you worked with as a resident to really say, hey, this is a great person, um, to be able to call that call the program and say, this is a great person you that, you know, I really think they would do well um, as a fellow. Um, they had, they, you know, were trying to get away from that from a residency match, but that's still very, you still need that in fellowship. Um, the other part, like I said, is that there's considerably less people. So your interview is much more individualized and you tend to interview with more people. Uh, so you have Fun. <laughs> shorter, shorter uh, interview or even a longer interview with longer day. So, yeah. <laughs> so what's a what's a day in the life of a geriatrics fellow walk us through what your typical day would be like yeah so fellows vary very much from your specialty and even your location so for my geriatric fellowship we worked in three different locations and each location was very different so one of them and the reason actually why i chose university of chicago is that it had a very strong um inpatient uh, presence. So we have a full consult service um, that we staff um, Monday through Friday. Um, so for that, it's very much like being on the floors um, of a hospital. Um, my day started somewhere around seven, um, chart checking, seeing morning labs, all of that. Um, I would then divide up our patient list to figure out who we needed to see, divide up our patient list with our team, um, whoever that may be. Sometimes it was just me. <laughs> um, but in general, we usually had uh, two or three residents and uh, one or two medical students in my team. Um, so we would divide those up. Um, occasionally we would round in the morning and afternoon, but usually it was just afternoon because our residents were really busy during the morning. Um, so I would go around and, and um, try and get things done that I could sit, get done, go and see some of my patients. Um, then we had a, a noon conference um, and then sometime around two o'clock would, would be rounds. We would go and round. Um, and then after that, and also including in the morning, um, so after, uh, sorry, after rounds and we were, may need to talk to the patient or family, um, we would do our notes. Um, and then anytime during the day, <laughs> we could get pulled into a um, family meeting, um, a medical team meeting, a specialist meeting, um, social work, um, interdisciplinary meeting, um, those were those kept our days very interesting. Um, so I would be done any time between five and 10 at night, depending on how lively <laughs> our list was, both in how many consults we got or um, um, one of the common reasons that we would be consulted in patient would be somebody who was uh, had dementia um, and was going through a lot of delirium, was really having difficulty. The medical team was having a lot of difficulty. Um, and so we would be working on medications they could use and behavioral techniques with both the staff and the family. So that takes a lot of time. Um, 
somehow I'm hand holding for that. <laughs> so um, that's inpatient. So outpatient looked very much like your typical primary. So I was a primary care um, doctor for patients who were 65 and older. Um, your typical eight in the morning, your first patient comes in at eight in the morning. Um, my last patient was at 4.30. Um, and afterwards I had notes. Um, and then after the notes, I was free to go to go home. Um, but uh, with being a primary care, there's always things to do and, and orders to add in and paperwork to do from specialists and that sort of thing. Um, my last place um, was at a nursing home. So as a primary uh, doctor for a panel of patients at the nursing home, um, that very varied quite a bit based on my attending on when that day started. Usually we were there for about eight hours, um, rounding on our patients, um, talking to the um, all of the staff. Sometimes if you get there early and you can talk to overnight staff, which was very helpful. Um, it often included um, calling family. Um, and then we would also have interdisciplinary rounds, especially with physical therapy, um, occupational therapy and dietary to see what they're eating and what they're not eating and what we can do about it. <laughs> um, and so those were interesting days. They were very unstructured. <laughs> but very hands-on, it sounds like. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what on the days that you're not, you know, starting at eight in the morning and working until 10, you know, do you have, a t have time for a life for other pursuits beyond medicine at the stage that you're at now? What do you like to do for fun when you're not working? <laughs> well, um... So I, um, I stress break, which people around me <laughs> much like for the most part. So when I'm stressed, I tend to bake goods. Um, and so uh, the nurses either love me or hate me about that. <laughs> um, um, I enjoy, um, I also enjoy art and then I just like being outdoors. So hiking, running, boating, can canoeing, swimming, all of those things, those are all great. Um, I um, haven't, as a trainee, you don't get a lot of time on your own. <laughs> um, so, but I have um, made a point the last couple of weeks, I am, since I'm hunting for a job, that while, as in addition to hunting for a job, I get to do something fun for myself. So that's been a lot of fun. Um, I call this time in Chicago, uh, fest season, because there's a, <laughs> large number of festivals going on every single week or weekend they can span so last weekend my brother came up um from uh from um kansas city and we hit five festivals in one weekend it was great <laughs> chicago is a very vibrant city yes there's always something to do Let's talk a little bit about how you got to where you are. Actually, Kahindi has a question about the match process for you. So maybe we'll ask a little bit about your internal medicine residency. So she wants to know, how is the whole match process for you? Did you match right away? Was it difficult? Interviews. Go on. Please, please, Dr. Chen. <laughs> okay. Well, so um, match is a stressful process for everyone <laughs> on both sides of the spectrum whether you're in the program or applying to a program so <laughs> um it is um and it's kind of hard to get away from that um so um my match experience was a lot of fun um, I had a lot of fun. I really enjoyed the rotate the uh, interviews. Um, it was pre COVID. So it was in person. <laughs> um, and it was fun. Some places would pay for a hotel and take you to dinner. And I mean, it, it was it was nice. Um, it was I enjoyed it. Um, and then, you know, you have interviews, my interviews averaged um, two to three people was usually how many people I interviewed with each, um, program. Um, I think only once, I think only one program only had one. And then I had another program that had 
four and another one that had five, um, but they were a panel. So you had all five people interviewing at, you at once. <laughs> um, it was interesting. It, it, was a, it was more like a dynamic conversation, which was, which was actually quite nice. Um, I did match. I matched with my second choice. My first choice only took two people. So I knew that that was unlikely, but hey, you know, we can dream. Um, <laughs> Why not? Um, and so I got my second choice. I was very excited to get my second choice. Um, and that was with um, Mercy at, at, in Chicago. Um, so um, I am commonly asked for um, recommendations and um, kind of my thought on, on match. Um, so my two recommendations, my two pieces of, of advice is to start early um, and um, and when I say that, uh, what I mean is while you're doing your rotations, you should be thinking about who you want to do your uh, letters of recommendation. Um, at the end or sometime soon to the end, you need to be asking them, would you be willing to do my letter of recommendation? Would you be able to give me a great letter of recommendation um, and get there and, and go ahead and get that permission um, and then send them an email every six months saying, hey, <laughs> how are you doing? I just don't want you to forget me. Obviously in more <laughs> processed words, but that is really what you need. Um, um, or they recommend every year, but I, if you, I mean, I say every six months. Um, and the other thing that you need to think about um, is can that person upload their letter of recommendation? If they cannot, you need to find out who will be helping them. Um, it can be somebody in their office, but you, while you're there, find out who you're go who's gonna help them load, load, you know, navigate the whole website. Um, Usually it's an office, you know, someone in the, that works in the office, but you should figure that out then while you're in the city. <laughs> um, and then the other thing that you should be thinking about is where, where are you going to interview? Um, all of the rotations that I did, I tried to pick a place that I was interested in uh, doing a residency. So I got to see their residency program up close and personal, meet people, see them and while they're doing their thing. Um, and so that's, um, um, I think that that's really important. Um, and I think that one of the things that people forget when they're going on this interview and they're very nervous um, is that you should be looking at seeing if this is a match for you just as much as they're seeing if this is, if you are a match for them. You should be looking around, look at your, um, look at the residents that are there. There was one place that I interviewed, I looked at the residents, I was like, no. <laughs> I'm Don't not ranking them. Yeah. <laughs> there was a program I didn't rank because they looked terrible. They did not look happy at all. Um, and the few things that they could tell me was, oh, well, we have this one rotation that's a blow off rotation that you don't actually have to go to, or you just kind of do minimal work and then you can run away. It's like, that's not what I want for my education. Like, this is, you gotta tell me how to become a doctor, you know? So there were several things that I looked at. I made a point to, if they had, you know, they all of them had, a, had at least one um, resident um, come and talk to us. Um, but I, when we were going on our um, tours and that sort of thing, I looked at how the residents were interacting with each other um, and that, and how the residents were interacting with their attending. Those two things were the most important to me. Um, and that's actually how I ultimately ranked my programs. Um, the other thing you should be working on is your uh, personal statement. This should be something that does not get done at the last moment. Um, you should get that done months ahead of time. Give it to as many people as you can, um, including non-medical people, because in some programs, the first person to start weeding out people is a non-medical person. 
Um, so your personal statement should touch non-medical people as well as medical people. Um, so I would encourage that. Um, and I would encourage people when you're thinking about where to apply, um, that you go to each and every program's website and make sure that you qualify or make sure that you're doing whatever that they are asking. Um, because if you don't make it through their filters, they will never know that you applied and that's a waste of your time and money. So I think that makes a lot of sense for um, the match in the US and the and CARMS in Canada as well. But I think that there's some application for students who are looking to do internships um, in Australia and New Zealand and Samoa as well, because you know, making connections while you're doing rotations is incredibly important. Yes. Making sure that you're making good connections, not only with the medical staff, but also the non-medical staff where, you know, it's those administrative staff that really can make a huge difference um, for you and ensuring that, you know, you're getting recommendations and be, being able to um, find places that are a good fit for you and not just find trying to find a place that yes. best you. So I think that's really great advice, Wendy. Thanks for sharing that. Um, okay, so I want to um, talk to you a little bit about, you know, before you get to um, the residency, is there, are there uh, additional steps that international medical grads have to go through before they're able to practice? You know, do you, do you find that there were like extra hurdles for you or extra things that you needed to do? And what was that like for you? Yeah, so there's a um, website called uh, ECFMG. Um, and you have to um, apply to them um, and you have to register with them. Um, and then um, they have to, um, so your medical school <laughs> and they have to connect um, and they both have to say, okay, to um, grant you access to take step one. Um, and then after you finish taking step one, step to both step twos if we still have them and then step three um and then they finally give you a like certificate that um you um, um ecfmg gives you a certificate and so you also have to have that in order to get your license anywhere in the us um but other than that like you don't have to take an extra exam um just because you're a um, international um, grad. Um, and um, I want just to let folks know, just if they're wondering, this might not have been in place when you were um, trying to get everything sorted with ECFMG, but we do have a, a, a staff person who's dedicated just to working with ECFMG to make sure all the paperwork goes in and everything's sorted for USMLE steps and for um, the match for students. So just so just so people know. And then for students who are in Australia and New Zealand, of course, you um, as international medical grads would take AMC one and two, as well as NSAID recs. And for those in Canada, um, you would be taking the MCCQE and NAC. So if you want some more information um, about those, I would suggest you kind of look uh, go to websites first and also your admissions counselor can provide you with some more information if you have questions about those. Um, okay, so I want to talk a little bit um, pre pre residency maybe in in clinical rotation. So where did you do your your clinical rotations with OUM? Um, basically all over the Midwest. Um, I think my most north was Wisconsin. Um, I did a Chicago, um, St. Louis, Kansas City uh houston um atlanta georgia and samoa i think i got all of them <laughs> what did you kind of take away from that experience of being able to do rotations in many different communities and many different hospital systems yeah so way? i specifically picked places that i thought i might be able to rotate at uh, or I mean, to I picked specifically picked, place, picked places to rotate at that I thought I might be able to apply for residency. Um, I um, 
really enjoyed being exposed to different medical systems. Um, I was interested in that on purpose. Um, uh, so I was exposed to different, different EMRs, um, different ways that the hospitals were set up, how admissions worked, how, you know, hospitalists, how hospital teams worked, um, um, doctors that were either employed or contracted, um, doctors that worked in the hospital and outside of the hospital or only worked in one or the other. I, I um, kind of, I was very curious what that looked like. Um, and so I wanted to see what that, so I wanted to see and rotate um, and, and see what that looked like, yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, so in the clinical years, of course, you're on site at clinical sites and learning medicine, <laughs> clinical skills hands on, but you also have um, curriculum to go through each week. So we do have a question in the chat window um, from Joshua, which was, what was your experience of learning medicine via distance education? Um, and was it difficult not having face-to-face -face contact? So maybe like, let's think about that in the clinical years and then answer it that, that way first and then the preclinical years, because in the clinical years, you have both the face-to-face -face contact as well as the distance learning. So can you tell Josh and, Joshua and, and the rest of us, what was that like for you? Yeah, so during my rotations, um, we had, um, so I had, um, the rotation, we had modules on uh, modules to be completed. Um, and then we had our case logs to do uh, questions to answer. Um, and then um, we had a reading list um, that we needed to read. Um, and then in addition to that, our um, attending may uh, give us also reading and things to do as well. Um, so it was a lot of time. Um, I spent a lot of time studying. <laughs> um, I needed support. Um, I could not have done it on my own. There were times I could not take care of myself, much less, you know, housework and cooking dinner for other people that, that I didn't have time for that. And some of my rotations, they were really busy. Um, um, so in that sense, the um, modules were nice in that I could do them at any time, at any place, as long as I had the internet. internet. Uh, so when I was, you know, doing night rotation, I could pull up my stuff and get stuff done at night, which was really cool. <laughs> I very much enjoyed that. Um, um, and it also allowed me to go all those different places. Um, most of the residents that I, um, that either I was working with or that joined me um, in residency, they'd only been to one system um, and they didn't, hadn't had the experience of knowing that things can be go, can be done differently. <laughs> Um, and so, um, in that sense, I found that really fascinating. I was, I, it was something that I was really interested in. Um, and so I think that that in a way was very helpful. Um, I had, uh, in a couple of my rotations, I was able to be there the whole all day. And, and then sometimes on the weekend where some of my, um, co-medical students either were gone every single Day, you know, a particular day of the week, like every Thursday, they weren't at their rotation, or um, they had a couple of half days that they weren't at the rotation. So in that sense, I felt like I got to spend more time um, at the rotation, wherever that meant, may have been inpatient or outpatient, but it meant also meant that I had to find time to take care of all of those other things, right? So it wasn't during my day um, like they had. Um, so it was, um, it, it takes planning. It, it's not something that you can just, ah, oh, get it done. No, no, you have to plan for that sort of thing. Um, um, and I think the same can be said for, uh, preclinicals. Um, so one of the things that I tell people when they first are starting, you know, OUM is that, um, distance learning is not, easier learning. It's different learning. Um, and 
you have to be aware that it takes just as much effort and just as much time. And so you have to plan for that. Um, when you uh, join, you are joining med school full time. Um, even if you don't have to be in the classroom, you still have to study. <laughs> and so you have to plan for, well, when are you going to do that work? You know, um, I found that I had to have a dedicated space to study and I had to plan when I was going to study. Otherwise, it kind of didn't get done <laughs> my, during my preclinicals. Um, so that was really important. Um, it was important that the people I was living with knew that when I was sitting at that desk, um, I was kind of off limits and that I was studying and they needed, if they had questions or whatever, they need to wait until after I was done. Um, and it, it still requires hard decisions. It still means that sometimes you're not going to get to go and do things, you know, that you want to do, um, that you, you know, have to make those decisions that right now I'm going to study and I'm going to get things done, but hopefully in the long run that gets me to my goals. Um, so that's something that you have to be conscious of. Um, the other thing for me is that I'm a social person. I like being around people. Um, I like being in the classroom around other people. Um, so I learned that I needed to um, be in a study group. And so a group of us started a study group. Uh, we met online. And then um, just before every every um, exam, we actually met in person in Philadelphia um, for a little while. That was fun. Um, yeah. It provided some camaraderie. Um, so um, that was cool. <laughs> yeah. I liked that you pointed out definitively that um, distance learning is not easier. And you'll often hear students and doctors saying there's no shortcuts in medicine. Yeah. There's no shortcut. So okay. it's not that, you know, you have um, fewer study hours when you're doing distance education. It's just that you get more say over when your study hours are. So because all of our um, coursework is offered live and recorded, you can attend all of the live sessions if that, you know, works with your learning schedule and you can listen to them recorded and you have all of the materials and textbooks um, available to you 24 hours a day. So you get some, you get a bit more control over what your schedule is, but it doesn't mean that you have less hours to plan for. So I think that planning aspect that you've pointed out is incredibly um, important as well. So um, I think there was a question um, about um, doing um, this kind of non traditional pathway um, that Josh was asking about as well. So um, the question was, what were your initial perceptions of taking OUM's non-traditional pathway as opposed to traditional pathways? And the reason why I'm kind of bringing that one up is because a lot of times students will think about um, medicine as me, um, at least in the preclinical years, is that you have to be in a big lecture hall being surrounded by a number of students who are like furiously taking notes on paper or laptop and like super competitive with each other. And that's not going to be the experience of um, an OUM student. So can you tell us a little bit about what that experience was like for you? Um, I, I don't know that I love the like the non-traditional term that we sometimes use, but just maybe it's a, an alternative pathway. It's a it's a pathway for those who, you know, it's not going to be the best thing for them to have to be in a classroom every Tuesday and Thursday from like 1030 until 3 p.m. But, you know, tell us tell us a little bit about what that was like for you. and Why did that that type of learning work for you? So when I first heard about it, I was like, nope. <laughs> Um, I had a friend who was actually who had applied and got in and um, um, I was like, that sounds like a scam. <laughs> I, that's truly that's what I thought. Um, he um, had a few classes and I actually was um, listening in on a, you know, he had he was on his computer and I was listening to it and I was like, hey, that 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 sounds like like actual classes, you know. <laughs> um, and um, he was like, this would be a great program for you. So um, they, um, it was again when 
they were meeting. Um, some of the classes were actually in person in, in Philadelphia. So I actually went out to Philadelphia um, to an in-person class. Um, and um, I, I enjoyed it. It, it, was, it was a lot of fun and it was great to meet people. And I enjoyed, um, you know, I, had, I knew that I liked um, medical education and um, that was, I mean, it, it fulfilled something that I was looking for. Um, and so I actually spent a little over a year researching OUM to make sure it was real, that if I did it, I could practice, that I could sit for, you know, the USMLE, um, that, um, so I, I did a lot of research and spent a lot of time looking at, at it um, before I said yes and jumped in. Um, and so um, uh, I obviously am very happy <laughs> that I did. Um, I, um, I actually didn't have too much uh, problem when I was doing my, um, um, when I was applying for residency, most people were actually just curious about it. Uh, there was only one person that really was very negative towards me, had already had made their mind up. Um, and it was obviously nothing I was going to say would make it better. Um, but um, other than her, um, everybody was like, so tell me about OUM. Sounds pretty cool. <laughs> um, so um, I had a fairly positive experience with it. Um, I think that as an uh, international grad, um, uh, it certainly has been my experience from in, in the US that uh, US grads get looked at first um, and then international grads get looked at um, for, you know, not just for, you know, or, uh, for residency, but for being put on, um, um, on like boards and and or and like um, projects and that sort of thing, um, but it's possible. Um, I you know let them know I'm interested. Here I am, and so I was put on several um, committees and boards and um, was given that. Um, but it did take effort on my part. I had to be there and you know make that known that I was interested and that you should consider me. So there's those two. Yeah. I, I just think it's funny about like, you know, what your initial perception was versus what you've been able to achieve now. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I also think about, you know, OUM probably um, was subject to a lot of scrutiny prior to COVID because we were the only ones, you know, doing a blended hybrid program where the first um, the preclinical years were online and then the clinical years were on site. And now <laughs> Ivy League universities in the, in the United States and Sandstone universities in Australia, all of them offer, you know, online preclinical courses now, which is something that we've been doing um, for nearly 20 years now. Um, and we also, you know, a lot of us who, um, who are employed as professors and as administrators here at OUM, you know, we also sought a non-traditional pathway for teaching. You know, we are individuals that um, are really qualified, but also, you know, um, traditional universities um, and the setup was not something that worked with us and our lives. But like for me um, and my, uh, we're, we're real, you know, we're really here, we're really teaching. You know, I teach reproduction and endocrinology. I have my PhD in reproductive endocrinology from UC Berkeley. I was a national Science Foundation fellow, my co-teacher, who's the dean for the U.S., has been an administrator in universities um, and was the chief uh, medical information officer in Missouri for a number of years. Our dean and vice chancellor in Australia have, you know, practiced medicine for over 50 years in those health systems. So we're just, we're also individuals where non-traditional pathways work for us and where, you know, we're, we've come together as a community, not only to support students, but also to support each other. So it's, it's a good place to be if you're, <laughs> and you're, yeah, I would also <laughs> say that that I feel like that that's also misrepresented in the sense that Yale and Harvard record all of their lectures and you can get them, you can listen to them um, on their intra, um, 
a campus system. And so they too have basically, you know, offer classes that you can, you know, listen to a recording and submit your questions and that sort of thing. So I think that it's not that novel, even though it's rep it may be represented that way, that there are actually a lot of institutions using that even before before COVID. But now <laughs> COVID, there's even there's there's even more that are going to keep a hybrid available. And we we're experts in it. This is what we've been doing all along. One of the yeah. things that I always laugh at is that my students will um, listen to they'll come to the lectures and then they'll listen to them after at like two times the speed. And I went and listened to myself and I was like, there's just no way I would listen to myself at two times speed. But it helps. It's, it's but hard. It helps whatever hard. works, whatever gets the information into your head. Yeah. So, I'm just going to look um, that um, that uh, Deborah is asking a little bit about rotations, and I want to uh, ask you that before I move on to the preclinical years. So Deborah wants to know how long would you typically stay at one rotation site before moving on to the next one? So um, most rotations are uh, four weeks. Um, you have your internal medicine, surgery, and I feel like there's another one. Community oh. medicine. Community, yeah, yeah, family medicine <laughs> that are longer. Um, but I didn't like stay past my rotation time um, for them because I did go from one to the other. Um, we had we had a week between for our finals, but I did go from one to the other. And Fawn wants to know, were the live lectures in the same time zones for you, or did you have to study in the early hours of the night? Yeah, um, I didn't have any really weird hours, um, but they were all over the day, morning, afternoon, evening. Um, I did have one um, a fellow medical student who was in Japan, and once or twice our class was at like two in the morning for him. <laughs> good thing he 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 was he's pretty good at you know changing uh, time zones. He was pretty alert and awake um, during our class. But um, yeah, I didn't have any crazy hours, um, but they were all over the the day and evening. Yeah. So so right now this is the time of day that lectures are offered. So it's eight to 10 Eastern time or 10 to noon, Australian Eastern time. I think it's 12 to two um, in the afternoon, some one time. So if you could come to this session and pay attention to that. <laughs> yeah, when, so okay. when, I was, when I was on, we still had, um, we still had uh, professors from all over the world. So like my uh, muscle skeletal was in Germany, neurology was from India, you know, they were, we were <laughs> all over. <laughs> we do still have professors from a lot of areas of the world, but we have standardized the class times now. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, getting getting into you and what pre, what preclinicals are, are like all of that. Um, so, you know, what did um, what did you think about going through preclinicals? We said that, you know, you needed to plan, you need to set aside adequate amounts of time for study. But what else do you think that, you know, prospective students need to consider before they embark upon the first couple of years of medical school? Um, this is not easy. This is not a path to become rich. <laughs> there's, a whole, there's a whole lot of other much easier ways for this. You have to want this for you. It's in my mind too difficult to do this for someone else. Um, this has got to be something that you really want that you're really passionate about. Um, and then you have to think about how you're going to make time for all of this. Um, I, there were, so um, in my cohort that started with me, um, they kind of thought they would be able to do all of their stuff. They were just trying to add this in to everything they were already doing. Um, and they, they didn't last very long, unfortunately, um, just because they, um, 
you know, there's only 24 hours in a day. <laughs> even even if you uh, skimp on that sleep, <laughs> yeah. you still uh, you still need to make up a little bit more than that. Um, and, and and eventually you should sleep too. <laughs> Speaking as a doctor, <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> we'll sleep when we're dead. Okay. Um. So I think that 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 there needs to be something that you're. In my mind, there needs to be an inner drive for you to do this um, because it's not easy. There's no part of it that's easy. Um, um, sometimes it's enjoyable and sometimes it's a lot of fun, <laughs> but um, it, 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 I guess, and, and, and certainly in the training, unfortunately, the way that it was, is set up, we still, it's still, in my mind, very archaic. And um, one of the reasons why I want to be part of the education is I want to change some of it. Um, <laughs> um, we can get into the history of the craziness of, um, of grand rounds and, 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 um, and rounding and all that. That can be another one. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, it's, it's something that you need to consider. And then once you're in, you need to be in. Um, you need to realize that, yes, there's going to be sacrifices that you make. Yes, you're going to miss things that you might want to enjoy. Um, but, um, you know, one of the things that I really enjoyed was going to a campus and studying. <laughs> Even though, you know, OUM didn't have a campus, I would take all of my homework. <laughs> I lived close to Baylor Medical School. Um, well, not technically the campus, but where their hospital was. And I would take all my stuff and go study amongst other medical students because they were also, you know, studying. Um, and, uh, you know, it's true, misery loves company. <laughs> um, I, and so, you know, basically what I'm saying is that I found, I found that helpful. Um, some people like to study alone. Um, and that is something that OUM gives you if you, you know, are better studying alone, then that's great. You have that ability. Um, um, so, and then you can come to class and, and then talk about it as well. Um, so that's one of the things that's really helpful about OUM. One of the things that I recommend uh, when people start is to find out what's your learning style. I think that's really important. It's something that I didn't really know until I started. <laughs> and you have these huge amounts of information, right, that you're somehow supposed to stick inside your brain at a very short amount of time and then be able to not only access it, but use it um, and going in, you know, third and fourth level thinking about being able to like give that information back. Um, and I think that that was really helpful. So, for example, I'm a visual learner. Um, so I started making pictures of um, information. Um, I still use those pictures today. <laughs> when I'm thinking about stuff and I, you know, those pictures that I made, I still pull them up in my, in my brain when I'm, when I'm, you know, making decisions and, and thinking about, about that information. Um, so I found that really helpful. Um, and that was something that I could bring up when I was really stressed. Um, sometimes, you know, we're very stressed. It's hard to access that information when we're, you know, really worried. I found that I could accept pictures. Um, and so that helped me a lot. Um, some of my um, co-medical students were audio, you know, were uh, audio learners. So they would, you know, talk, they would speak their lessons. They would, you know, say things that they needed. Um, I knew someone who would sing them. Um, so yeah, whatever, you know, find out what works for you. <laughs> so I encourage people to do that. Um, and I also encourage people, even if you are an individual learner, in other words, you want to be alone, uh, you don't want anybody around you, you need quiet, that you still have to have that conversation or interaction with the information to be able to truly use it. Like your you know, when you're on rounds and you're standing, um, you know, at a bedside and the attending asks you a question, they aren't asking you the rote memorization out of a book. You have to use, you know, 
four different modules that you went through, pull all of them up from all the different, you know, times, roll them all together and be able to be able to spit out that answer. Um, and if you don't practice that, it's very difficult. And that is what one of, so not only do they ask you on our rounds, that is also what they ask you on USMLE, um, Canadian, the, you know, Canadian and Australian, I've seen the, you know, questions for all of them, all of them have third and fourth level thinking questions. Um, so you do have to use, be able to, to access that and kind of play with that information for lack of better word, um, but be able to, you know, pull different things and realize how you can apply that, I guess, applying probably is a better word. Um, and I think that that's something that you have to be comfortable with. We actually have now in orientation a study skills and learning styles module that students go through that then they can work with their advisor as they start the courses so they can kind of learn and learn their learning style and then develop their study strategy as they move forward because what we find is, uh, you know, it's not just in your board examinations, but your examinations and your preclinicals and clinicals are also going to be those third and fourth levels where it's not going to be enough to just have a flashcard and memorize a particular term. You have to know how to apply that and what situations it applies to. Um, so I think that's really good advice. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, OUMSA, the OUM Student Association, because this question is kind of bumping around in my mind. You said, you know, I was some students like to study alone, but you have to also make connections. So are OUM students connected with each other? What's the role of OUMSA and all of that? Yeah, um, so OUMSA was actually started to provide students a sense of community. Um, we're all over the place and, and medical school, even in person, can be very isolating. Um, and so being, um, you know, a distance learner can be even more isolating um, and more frustrating. So it was a place to connect. Um, it was also a place to provide uh, students to have a voice, um, both within OUM and the student body, but also with administration and the professors, um, that it wasn't, um, that when somebody said something, it wasn't like one voice kind of complaining um, that we were able to provide a consensus or something that was um, concerning to the uh, student population um, that we could bring up and work on trying to make things better. Wonderful. Okay, and I also, I'm the liaison for the OEM Student Association. I'm also the liaison for our new OUM Alumni Association, which I roped um, Dr. Chen into. <laughs> so um, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, you're an inaugural board member on the OUMAA. So can you tell us a little bit about what the Alumni Association is hoping to do this year? Yeah, um, I'm very excited to be a part of that. It sounds amazing. <laughs> um, um, so we're, we're just kind of Getting, getting started, but I think our goals were really, like really well stated um, in our terms of reference in that our purpose is to represent the alumni community and support the university. Um, I think that kind of is very great and all encompassing um, as a diverse group of people all over the world. Um, we hope to, to uh, provide a sense of community and camaraderie. Um, and um, I think Right now, we have some amazing alumni. Um, I'm hopeful that we can provide mentorship, um, knowledge, education, um, emotional support, <laughs> um, and networking uh, for our alumni, as well as our current students. Um, and look forward to figuring out how we can support both grads and medical students um, in any other way as we grow. Wonderful. And Wendy and I have been talking a little bit about, you know, how how can we uh, better create some connections between our alumni and each other and our alumni and our students. So we're looking forward to working together on that. Um, so Margaret wants to know um, what ways can a candidate, I think, I mean, meaning a candidate for admission into OUM, in what ways can they stand out? Research, gap year, Sutter, what do you think? What do you think, Wendy? What would make someone stand out as an applicant at OUM? 
Um, so when I'm looking at applicants, I haven't looked at medical medical students. I've looked at residents um, because I was I've been on I've been on the other side of the program, <laughs> <laughs> accepting accepting applicants. Um, so uh, a couple things I I want to know that they have looked around and decided that medicine is is for them. So I want to know of um, why medicine interests them. So, um, and, and you can show me in multiple ways, including volunteering, um, being active in a program. Um, I want to know that you've been exposed to the medical system. It is very not perfect and any country, <laughs> um, some countries worse than others, but <laughs> um, I can give you my opinion on that. In a different <laughs> um, but um, um, I, I wanna know that you've thought about it. Um, I wanna be able to have a conversation with you. When, so when you're interviewing with me, I wanna, I wanna be able to have that conversation with you. Um, so um, um, doing things in the medical, field, whether it's an actual job as a scribe or, um, you know, having a particular job at, at, at a uh, hospital or a doctor's office or something like that, um, whether you volunteer, um, whether you've been exposed to the medical community as a family member or a patient, um, I want to know about that. Um, one of the big things um, in becoming a doctor is that you're expected to be a leader. Um, at all times. Um, and um, so I want to also see leadership. Um, I want to see that you are going in and trying to look at things, um, make things better, um, looking at being a part of a team. Um, so I often ask people about teamwork because um, it's not the easiest thing, but as a doctor, you're kind of in that for the rest of your medical career. <laughs> um, um, so um, that's got to be something that's kind of high on that list. <laughs> um, and um, I think that one of the things, um, certainly on you know a resident level, that I want to see is they also know um, how to uh, decompress. Um, it's a very stressful place. Um, certainly with COVID, there was a lot of hate, um, a lot of really negative interactions. You have to be able to take care of yourself emotionally. So I want to know that you do something besides medicine. <laughs> that, you know, what do you do when you're stressed? Um, that you have like a positive coping mechanism or, 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 or support, you know, those types of things. Um, I want to know that as well. Um, and then um, I would tell you to also wherever you're applying, whether it's a medical school or, or, or residency that you go look at the website and they tell you all these amazing things about what they want <laughs> from you. Um, and so um, they tell you what they're looking for. Truly, people don't try to hide that. Um, so I, you know, I like to get on on a website and, and really see um, what their program is interested in um, and see if that aligns to what your interests are. Thanks, Wendy. I'll speak a little bit um, about uh, for medical students, since I'm um, one of the members of the interview panels at OUM, there's no secret sauce for <laughs> what you like, what all, you know, what your personality needs to be in order to get into OUM or any medical school. Of course, we do have minimum requirements that you can find on our website and get a little bit more detail on from your admissions counselor. But beyond that, like we want to know who you are. Um, we want to know that you're driven. Are you going to be able, are you passionate? Are you going to be able to sustain that um, drive that that ability to move forward even when there's adversity that's placed in your way. So sh show us that. Tell us a little bit about your drive and your passion. Um, we want to know that you're a good community member. OUM is a really collaborative community. It's a really supportive community, but it only works because we're all here to support each other. We're all here, you know, with a common purpose in mind. So when students know um, the mission statement of the university and they embody some of that, I really look 
um, for that, I want to know the contributions that you're going to be able to make um, to our community, the contributions that you make to the communities that you're um, a part of. So that's something I always look for. So if you're going to, if you're in an interview with me, <laughs> I'm going to really think about some of that stuff. But I think what we're all, you know, what we all want to know is, are you someone that's really is, is passionate and is committed to doing this and is willing to go the distance and to put in the work to, you know, achieve the dream that you've had for a while? So that, that would be my side. I want to ask you kind of one final question, Wendy, and it's one that I hear from every student, every graduate about what is something that is very, very important for success in medical school um, at, and at OUM in particular. And I think the answer like surprises some people, but what I always hear is that it's your support system that really determines your um, ability to succeed and to persevere through um, getting through medical school, getting through clinical rotations, getting through the match. So uh, can you tell me a little bit about your support system? Did you find that to be true? Yeah, there's no way. There's no way I could have gotten through medical school without, without some support. Um, um, like I alluded to earlier, sometimes with your rotations and sometimes with, you know, you even with medical class, school classes, you don't even have time to take care of yourself, much less, <laughs> not that that's the way it's supposed to be, but um, uh, much less, you know, do household chores and pay bills and take care of, you know, the car and all uh, there's, yeah, there, I, I needed, I need, it would definitely need support before that. <laughs> um, the, uh, the other thing was to have a um, mentor that was in the, you know, medical that, you know, was in the medical system. Um, there's, I, I am, I am sure I would not have made it through medical school if it hadn't been for Dr. Ghazi, who was my physician mentor at OUM. Um, there were times that I called him crying, like, I'm not going to do this. This is not going to work. I'm, you know, so, um, and he was like, take a deep breath you're going to be fine. <laughs> um, you're not alone. <laughs> yeah, you're not alone. <laughs> um, so uh, yes, I, I, I think that that um, support is really important. Um, sometimes you find support in unusual places as well. Um, and um, I had a lot of support along my along the way. Um, several, several of my, um, rotations, I should say most of my rotations, um, my attendings were really supportive. Um, I met some amazing medical students along the way. Um, we still meet up and chat online. Um, um, especially my group from Atlanta, I think all but one of them I still chat with. Um, so yeah, it, it, you, you meet some amazing people. Um, several of my, of them are already attendings, um, have gone on to fellowships, that sort of thing. So it's very exciting. It's, it's neat, um, to make connections to people, um, all over the world. Um, um, that was really enjoyable. Um, yeah, I think that that I definitely would not have made it if I did not have um, some, some great support um, from my family, from my friends, from OUM, from you know, my co-medical students, that sort of thing. Thank you so much, Dr. Wendy Chen, for spending some time with us. I know you give your of your time very generously, um, but don't have a lot of it all the same. So we really appreciate um, the time that you've taken with us this evening slash this morning. Um, if you have additional questions as a prospective student or some of you are new students that are joining us uh, here today as well. So for prospective students, if you have some additional um, questions, want to know a little bit more about your situation in particular, I do encourage you to get in touch with your admissions counselor. Um, if you're a current student or a new student, feel free to get in touch directly with me and I'm happy to support um, you with finding any information that you don't already have access to. I want to thank each of you as well for your time. I know all of you are very busy, those of you who are preparing to study medicine and those of you who have just started or even completing studying medicine. I really appreciate your time and attention and 
have um, really enjoyed having you all here today. So thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you at our next uh, webinar session, which is going to feature our student ambassadors and our current executive for our OUM Student Association. So we'll hope, we hope that you'll join us again in a month's time. See you then.